Thanks everyone for coming. And it's my incredible pleasure and honor to privilege to introduce uh, Paul Eisenstein, who's a professor of English at the Otterbein University, which is in Columbus, Ohio. And he's the author of a book called Traumatic Encounters, which I think is the best book written on the Holocaust and literature, but even on the Holocaust as such. And he's also the co-author of a book called Rupture, which I would praise to the hilts, but I can't because I'm the other author of it. Uh, so, uh, and I think that, uh, I don't have a joke, I just have, I want I, cause my, I don't, he, he, I mean, he's very funny, so I'll just let him tell the jokes himself. Uh, and I don't want to steal from his thunder, but uh, he, he's, this, this is just a thing that I think about him that I, when I think about someone who's a theorist who uh, writes and communicates, they, I think he's the most poetic theorist I've ever heard. So that's a low bar to set for him. <laughs> so hopefully this will be kind of a combination of like incredible theory and poetry. The, the talk, the title of the talk is um, Thinking Time on Walter Benjamin. Here in, uh, join me in welcoming Paul. To oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Everyone hear me pretty well? Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Todd. Yeah, really happy to be here. Thanks for turning out. I really appreciate it. I'm going to be talking for you know quite a spell today on Walter Benjamin, but I thought maybe at the start I would sort of describe a little bit how I kind of came to Benjamin, or sort of like what's in the back of this talk. Um, so in the, the text at the back of it is this uh, 2016 film directed by Denis Villeneuve called Arrival. Maybe some of you have seen this film, but it's really this unique, um, I think formally inventive film that has kind of two signifying chains. The first two and a half minutes of the film are almost a film in its entirety. It's the birth of a child and, and then as she's kind of growing up and then she dies of a rare disease. This all happens in two and a half minutes, so it's quite, quite condensed. And then the second half is really the movie proper, which is the arrival of some uh, alien beings. They come in these 12 egg-shaped shells and land in locations all over the, all over the world and they produce a kind of state of emergency. And, you know, I think there's a kind of sequential chronology that is established between the two signifying chains. Um, and at a certain point in the film, the film kind of undergoes this sort of formal convulsion. Um, in the hands of a lesser director, you know, whenever there are films about aliens uh, landing, there's always like these conflict of attitudes films where you have like, in this case, the good liberal English professor who wants to understand the alien other and learn their language and communicate with them. And on the other hand are these like military personnel who see the alien other as a, you know, an enemy threat that has to be like possibly killed. Um, and I think one of the things that's so unique about this film is that in the second half, there are a series of images that appear to belong to the first signifying chain that you think are belong to a kind of temporal continuum. And Villeneuve, uh, he just totally changes the ontological status of those images at a certain point. So if you like films that are completely surprising and they introduce a certain moment where you kind of don't know what you're watching, this is, the, this is the film for you. And we can kind of return to this maybe near the end. But it's that interest in like a, a, a kind of arrest of temporality or a kind of experiment of formal convulsion related to time that led me to Benjamin. And um, in the course of working on Benjamin, I think uh, a sort of other feature of this project emerged, which was to kind of reclaim Benjamin for Marxism. Because um, somehow Benjamin has become like a relay point between Nietzsche and Foucault as a theorizer of biopower and how to get out of biopower. Um, but I think really what I hope to try to get across today is that Benjamin is a thinker very much interested in the politics of commodity production and that Benjamin is a thinker of the object under capitalism, like the space that objects occupy and the, the time of the object. And then sometimes, you know, what it means to give ourselves the time to think, you know. So at the core of Marxism's uh, analysis of capitalism is that the processes of production uh, are concealed or made imperceptible by design. And Marx says that the process of production disappears in the finished commodity. So, you know, in first volume of Capital, when Marx is talking about the enigmatic quality of commodities, he says that, like, commodities just appear to us as if they were just, like, magically, organically made. Like, as if the labor responsible for a commodity's production was already an objective property of the commodity itself. 
And I think this has led some correctly to claim that the commodity is a kind of imposter, right? Um, and one of the problems with seeing the labor that goes into the production of a commodity as in one of its objective properties is that nothing interrupts its production and consumption. Um, so when the labor power contained and concealed in a product of labor is taken for granted as one of its objective characteristics, there's really no space or duration to think the social conditions uh, that characterize its production. And one of the lifelong preoccupations of Walter Benjamin was to crack open uh, or break apart the commodity and thereby carve out a space uh, and a duration for considering its formal history. And Benjamin theorized the breaking apart of the commodity by focusing on all manner of uh, finished and believed to be whole objects, works of art, the design of cities, ordinary articles of clothing, furniture, technological inventions, and, and a lot more. And in his own writing, he modeled this kind of cracking open of the commodity in books and essays that often consist of just loosely assembled or not really explicitly connected parts. And the most famous of these is a, a book that translated into English is called The Arcades Project. It was originally titled Paris, Capital of the 19th Century, and it consists of 36 alphabetized and individually named file folder sections that contain more than 800 pages of uh, transcribed quotations and commentary through which Benjamin uh, sought to capture the new and by the 1920s forgotten panoply of objects and experiences that constituted the emergence of modern urban and industrial commodity, product, commodity capitalism. Benjamin worked on this project from 1927 to 1940 and he gave it to his friend George Bataille uh, when he was forced to flee Paris as a result of the Nazi occupation of France and it was that flight that led, many of you might know, to the fatal dose of morphine he took in the Spanish border town of Port Bou at the end of September 1940. In an analogy that gives us some sense of the bound energy contained in the commodity and waiting to be unleashed, Benjamin likened the method underwriting the form of the Arcades Project to the process of splitting apart an atom. And for Benjamin, the breaking apart of finished and believed to be whole objects was a kind of handmaiden to class struggle and to the challenge to capitalist property relations. So it was like an indispensable feature uh, or, or ingredient to the creation of conditions wherein the thoughtlessly propulsive dimension of capitalist production and consumption might be interrupted. And Benjamin called this uh, propulsive dimension of capitalism its ideology of progress. And he was always trying to interrupt or call a halt to or somehow get in the way or make us think about what this progress uh, concealed largely the violence involved in commodity production. So to crack open and linger uh, uh, with parts of the commodity is to, in some sense to reverse and to get a glimpse at the commodity's constructedness. Um, more importantly, the commodity in pieces enables us to encounter the materiality of an object's parts before human labor, uh, turn those parts into a valuable or meaningful whole. So, just how are we to restore or reverse the history of the commodity that its form seeks to conceal? For Benjamin, the answer to this question involves him in the development of a theory and a method committing to changing the ontological state of the material components of the commodity, somehow wresting the constituent parts of the commodity away from the total form in which they are subsumed. Now, if you go to any store or visit any e-commerce site, nothing really encourages the extraction of the commodity's material parts uh, from the productive processes and social values that they contain. Okay? Um, but in lots of other venues, capitalism itself kind of enacts the extraction for us. And there are a couple of different reasons for that. You know, capitalism is predicated on mass production, so they produce way more things than we need. Consequently, things are prematurely discarded. And capitalism also depends on this thing called novelty. It venerates novelty. Um, Benjamin called newness the quintessence of false consciousness whose indefatigable agent is fashion. <laughs> and in the 19th century, one of the things that Benjamin noticed with the rise of, of modern urban industrial commodity production is the casting off of things at a rate and on a scale that was just previously unknown. So if instead today, I think, instead of shopping malls and new car lots, you just think of landfills, junkyards, boarded up houses, uh, even the middle of the ocean, you can see how the refuse and detritus of capitalism itself facilitates an encounter with commodified objects whose ontological state has changed. 
One of the most complicated and uh, novel insights of Benjamin's is his claim that these isolated or disintegrated parts of a formerly whole object are actually engaged in a unique form of communication. This notion uh, predates Benjamin's explicit turn to Marxism, but it's one that will go on to animate an anti-capitalist ontology of objects that clarifies the tension that is part of the capture of material by the commodity form. And Benjamin has this basic idea, which really is that there's a distinction between a mental entity, okay, a mental entity, an idea, that, uh, uh, something that exists in my mind, and a linguistic one. And in 1916, in an essay that was only published uh, posthumously, the title of the essay is On Language as Such and on the Language of Man, uh, Benjamin refers to this distinction as unquestionable. Okay? And he claims and laments that too frequently an identity between a mental entity and a linguistic entity is asserted. Now, obviously, in ordinary acts of communication, this false identity is taken for granted by many of us. So if you just think of like cooking recipes or owner's manuals or policy speeches or news articles or beach reads or true crime broadcasts, you know, this point is pretty obvious. Like what is important about the communicative words that I hear or read is their instructive and informative content, like what they refer to or get me to understand. But for Benjamin, the sensuous, like the visual and aural dimension of language, what he called language as such, is something that has to be distinguished between the instrumentalized language of man, communicative language. And it's true that mental entities no doubt become linguistic. They take their place in the world of purposeful human communication. Um, but, uh, but the emergence and efficacy of a sign's linguistic or referential being does not produce an identity with the sign as a mental entity. And Benjamin claims that the assertion of that identity is the great abyss into which all linguistic theory threatens to fall. And he claims that the task of theory is to survive suspended precisely over this abyss. So the task of theory is to insist on a disjunction or gap right between a mental entity and a linguistic one i'm talking about like a moment of suspension where something occupies my attention like i it's an object of uh, a mental entity without it yet being named or known or able to be communicated to others in the abyss to which benjamin alludes the object or thing is the bearer of this really strange and empty expressivity that he calls a communicating muteness Benjamin's isolation of the prelinguistic, communicatively mute dimension of the sign anticipates what he will later see in the abandoned and broken down commodity, the parts of a commodity whose ontological state has changed because they have been separated from the whole of capitalist social relations of which they were once a part. So the sign that wavers in or maybe has abdicated its referential function and the discarded, decaying parts of the commodity that no longer have value in relation to other commodities, they confront us with what I'm calling this like unique ontological state of the object in which it exists and is cognized purely as an object of perception, like the bearer of perceivable properties, like this is oval, and like this is brown, and this is a square. Um, and the defining quality of the object in this state is what Benjamin will call image being. This is a, like a huge concept in Benjamin. Like in, 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 in its image being, the object is available to human perception, but it's not part of a larger, useful, or valuable whole. And you know, Benjamin was a huge fan of the surrealist artistic practices, which I think some of you in this class have maybe studied, because one of the things about surrealist artists, the outcome of surrealist art practices is that they're not supposed to really mean something one observes them and the attempt to impose a meaning on them is somehow frustrated. The term Benjamin deploys to name the changed ontological state of the object is allegory. Okay. Um, and his use of this term gets its most sustained exposition in this book that he wrote called The Origin of the German Trauerspiel. It's a study of a set of 17th century German tragic Baroque morning plays. Uh, Benjamin wrote this book in 1925 as part of this, you know, in Germany you have to write two theses to get a university position, two dissertations, one, one is not enough. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really hard, it's like almost incomprehensible, and it's incomprehensibility at the time that he wrote it was one of the reasons that he didn't pass, his committee didn't pass him. And uh, this was an outcome that at the time unfairly 
I think he felt unfairly denied him the economic security of a career as a university professor. But later, he came to see things a little bit differently. Like, he fortuitously escaped the career of a professor. Because <laughs> there are like things called students, and they like, you know, I don't know, require your time, I guess. Um, in any event, um, in the allegorical objects that he discovers in Baroque morning plays, uh, Benjamin finds an artistic signifying practice that will become the basis for a materialist political philosophy centered on the isolation of things in a space in which they are encountered as material objects of visual perception. So allegory, if you read Benjamin, it's like this really protean concept. It gets invoked in lots of different ways. It's, it's like an, uh, there's an allegorical intention that is like an artistic intention that, it, that intercepts and derails meaning. There's an allegorical method that shatters holes and disperses um, its parts. Allegorical perception, it's a mode of perception that's at home among ruins. Um, and it's also sometimes an expressive property of objects themselves. But I think what is most significant about allegory um, is the preeminent place it accords to the experience of visual perception, okay? Um, Benjamin once wrote, the primary interest of allegory is not linguistic, but optical, okay? It's like what you can see, okay? Um, now, this promotion of allegory, um, by his own admission, is, a, is like a revaluation. Like allegory, at the time Benjamin was writing, was kind of not venerated. Like in fact, it was seen as a very conventional mode of expression and also a very constraining one. So in a traditional allegory, um, particular objects and signs are yoked to a larger idea that's antecedent to the work that the parts of the work just mechanically express. So if you just think of, allegories like uh, that are about the conflict between virtue and vice, for example. Um, these are like conventional acts of signification. Um, they typically have a very discernible, almost obvious moral message um, or political message and um, that is external to the allegorical artwork and which is the thing that they seek to communicate. And if you just think of like, I don't know, Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, 1678. It's the journey of a protagonist named, are you ready, Christian, who is going to go to the celestial city. And all the characters and place names are, are obviously expressive of Bunyan's antecedent and overarching Christian commitments. But for Benjamin, these, these Baroque plays, they're in, especially in written form, they're up to something totally different. So he thinks that there's this modern allegorical form of expressivity that does not trap words or sequences of words in totalizing ideas that they can do nothing but mechanically express. Um, so modern allegorical expression for Benjamin is not like a perfunctory illustrative technique. That it, it does not enact a conventional relation between a signifying image and its signification. Now, on what basis can he make uh, this claim? Um, his basic idea is that there are certain things in these morning plays that obstruct or impede, they get in the way of the signifying image and its signification. Um, and because they get in the way, we are made aware of the image space of signification itself. So what the formal features of the Trauerspiel do is to redirect our attention away from the space of the signified, what is being signified, and to the space of our optical perception of the sign as such. And this change spatial emphasis is what Benjamin gets at when he says that in the Trauerspiel, the essence of the object is dragged out in front of the image. What is crucial to Benjamin's political veneration of Baroque signifying practices is the unbelievable array of excessive and ostentatious attributes of the Baroque style. So like in these morning plays, especially in their printed form, there's like a, an array of anagrams, uh, syllabic permutations, you know, uh, 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 erratic capitalizations, you know, emblematic embellishments at the level of printing or typography, okay? And if you were to see these, I mean, maybe you would say like, gosh, like this is like a, what's with these ornamental flourishes? Or like, isn't this like an artistic defect? This type of excessive, ostentatious display of like embellishments at the level of what you see. Um, but for Benjamin, um, these attributes are part of what he glimpses as a tense formal struggle between the objectives of the narrative plot of a play and the material features that don't share the same objectives. So like broken down parts of a commodity, these signifying practices merely like occupy or take up space. You know, um, 
So the, from this vantage point, the Trauerspiel at the level of their form are sites of a kind of political struggle. And Benjamin has this great way of putting it. He basically claims that the language of the Baroque is constantly convulsed by rebellions among its elements. So there's a kind of political rebellion that's happening like at the level of the sentence or on the actual page. Um, and it's a little bit like, uh, like the bits and pieces of language have sort of said like, I won't serve. You know, like it's like Bartleby, like I prefer not to. I, I don't want to serve the process of communication. Now, okay, slight digression. How am I doing so far? Doing okay so far? Okay. Um, uh, slight digression. So, so, you know, Benjamin once said that um, there was a Jewish world inherent in his thought. And, and his friend Gershom Sholem once thought that, once claimed, joked that he could become the next Rashi. Rashi is like the single most famous commentator on the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible. He like lived and wrote in the 11th century in France and his commentaries exist, have had existed for 500 years in almost every single printed version of like the Talmud or the Torah. And, and I think one thing I want to try to say about like this extraction of single parts from like holes, you know, is actually a method that Benjamin got from like some of the ancient rabbis who did the same kind of thing uh, relative to the 24 books of the Hebrew Bible. So, I mean, uh, like they, they take like a great story. Like how about this Genesis? It's like a great story, right? It's like sequential. It's like chronological. It's propulsive. It moves forward, right? And the rabbis thought that like that style of storytelling, you now you need to like halt it and like look at like one single sentence or one single phrase and focus on little things. And you could come up with a lot that is being concealed, right? Um, and the greatest example of this is actually the very first line of the of Genesis, in the beginning God created heaven and earth, I think it is, yeah. Uh, and in Hebrew, the very first letter is the Hebrew letter bet. It's not the first letter al aleph. And the, so you have like this great story, like keep going. No, the rabbis just focus on like, why does the Bible begin with the letter bet, you know? And then they actually do this quite amazing Benjaminian sort of thing where they look at like the visual properties of the Hebrew letter bet. I'm going to draw it here. It's like it's like a backwards C. And because it's like a square without the, I guess without the right side of it, you know, it has the, if they look at its visual properties and they see, well, clearly it's walling off everything that's before it. And it's also preventing any inquiry, apparently, from, of uh, the world above the earthbound and the world below. So in the very visual properties of a letter, they already are coming up with like different meanings and associations. Um, that are that are worth ruminating over. Now, I will say, obviously, the point of the rabbinical interpretations is to cement like the truth of God, and and, and at some point, like Benjamin took this method of rabbinical exegesis, and obviously turned it more toward Marxist and revolutionary um, revolutionary political ends. So. So I've been describing to this point Benjamin's attempt to theorize a space wherein we encounter material that's been liberated from its capture by the commodity form, okay? And for Benjamin, there are such spaces in the world, and there are even ways to create such spaces by breaking apart the objects that we habitually regard as whole or objectively produced. Um, and this is one of the tasks that's modeled and enacted in works of art. Um, so inseparable from this creation of an image space, okay, is that a different dimension of time emerges, okay? So when you encounter the image being of an art object, there's something different about the temporality that characterizes that, that, that moment. Um, so when we privilege the optical over the linguistic, the allegorical object over the commodity, the sign and its image being over what a sign productively signifies, our ex conception and experience of time can change. And Benjamin refers to this poetically as the wind of a coming dawn that blows cool from inside every work of art. In the way that it produces this new experience of time, art, he claimed, helps to provide the true definition of what is involved in progress. Progress for Benjamin, it has its seat not in the continuity of elapsing time, but in its interferences 
And he claimed that's when the truly new makes itself felt for the first time. I think there's a great link to arrival that maybe we can talk about later. Um, this new interrupted experience of time contests the quietism and conformism that results from capitalism's naturalization of the propulsive dimension of time. And I think if we're to deepen the political salience of Benjamin's notions of the optical and the allegorical and image being, we should add two temporal ones. He developed these notions of the stopover and the standstill. Now, I think if you think about writing, forms of writing that press toward image, that kind of become image, this is true, I think, even in your own everyday life. Like, when you encounter writing, like say it's in someone's handwriting, it can be harder to discern, right? And it simply takes longer to kind of understand like what is being communicated. Um, so I think there's a way in which a different or slower sense of time uh, comes about when what it is you're encountering is not immediately intelligible. So I would claim that this delay, like the fact that you have to spend some time to figure out what is being said, that is like the temporality of the object in its image being. And if you've ever had to read like handwritten letters or journals, especially from the 19th century, Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, you know, y y just to identify certain marks on the page takes time. Um, and this is true um, even in, in understanding a person's dreams. Like it takes time to understand the parts that are a part of a dream. Now, everyone here knows, I think, that at one level, um, the degree to which capitalist production and consumption relies on a unidirectional and increasingly accelerated sense of time is obvious, okay? Like time under capitalism is defined by capital's identifiable and linked categories of movement. Um, Marx, I think correctly sees that capitalism is the movement of capital through a circular clockwise circuit from money capital to productive capital to commodity capital, and then the renewal and repetition of the circuit itself. Okay. Um, I think he said circulating capital is not a particular form of capital, but that is capital itself. Um, and if you just think of like the invention of credit, okay, the formation of joint stock companies, the emergence of the class of money capitalists, bankers and lenders and financiers. If you think of the development of large and concentrated money markets like in London and New York, all of these phenomena are tied to the need to maintain and accelerate the fluidity of the stage of the circuit in which the produced commodity is transformed into money and then back. Now, Marx concedes there are unavoidable durations of time that affect the movement of capital through the circuit. Okay. Like he invokes this concept of lying fallow to get at how specific branches of production sometimes face temporal barriers that amount to deductions from the surplus value uh, created by the, via the appropriation of human labor. And the forms of these delays are varied, but for example, it, like, it takes a while for a winemaker's grapes to ferment, or it takes time for a commodity to travel to the market, and it takes time for the commodity to be sold. But one of the relentless features of capitalism is the relentless uh, desire to shorten those times. And in the second volume of Capital, he has a long kind of explanation of like different categories, like production time, uh, which consists of like working time and waiting time, and then circulation time, which is like the time it takes to get the commodity to market, and then the time for it to be purchased, and then converted back into money. Um, and then this, this turnover time, which is really when you add production time and circulation time, and it's the time, it's the sum of production and circulation, it's the time it takes for a quotient of capital to complete one trip through the circuit. Um, and in each of these units of time and the relay points between them, the goal is to eliminate the time in which capital might move too slowly. Okay, so like uh, shortening the specific amounts of the time is just critical to the reproduction and multiplication of capital's values. So that's why like he notes how breeders, for example, like reduce the bone structure of sheep so that they can like get fat enough for slaughter after one year instead of four or five. Or like factory owners, they see their machines are idle, so like let's have a second shift and a third shift, you know. Um, and then the, he notes how faster and increased quantities of Sailing ships and steamships and rail trains enable goods to travel more quickly and more frequently to market. Um, the goal is to eliminate something that he calls reflux, which is like something that, like, like it's a gastrointestinal condition, like things get backed up, you know. Um, 
Reflux is the name for the condition in which flows are obstructed and things come to a halt. Um, and Marx, he talks a little bit about what can happen at various stages when reflux takes place. So if capital comes to a standstill in the first phase, money capital to commodity capital, money forms into a hoard, like there's a hoard of money. And if this happens in the production phase, the means of production uh, cease to function and labor power, like machines are just idle, okay? And if it happens in the last phase, commodity capital back to money capital, then there are like unsaleable stocks of commodities that, are, that exist somewhere, okay? So hoarded money, unused means of production, idle means of production, unsaleable stocks of commodities. Like what do all these things have in common? Like the coming to rest of capital, okay? And this is why uh, at some level it's just so significant that the various phases pass into each other without delay, okay? Okay, now, we're gonna get back to Benjamin here in a second. Um, so what is money when it is hoarded? What is a machine or human labor power when it is idle? What is a surfeit of commodities in a warehouse or store somewhere that can't be sold? To pose these questions is already to point to one of the outcomes of an obstruction in the flow of capital, which is the emergence of a duration of time in which things appear as objects of philosophical thinking and questions. So it's interesting that Marx, you know, on a couple of occasions invokes the speed of thought okay, as naming the maximum aspirational velocity for the transition of capital from one phase to the next. So the speed of thought is one of continuous production, continuous generation of wealth. It's like the impossible fantasy of capitalism, if things could just move at the speed of thought. Marx calls this circulation without circulation time and employs the phrase, in no time. We use this phrase all the time, like, I'll be there in no time, like, really quickly, you know. Um, uh, to, to characterize its speed, the way that one concept just turns into the next. And the form of thinking that he's alluding to here, I think, is it's a habitual and inescapable. It's like the quick, unself-reflective thinking of everyday mental operations. I think Benjamin's question is, look, does thinking itself always have to be so speedy? Benjamin's wager is that in the face of the object image, thinking itself can experience a form of reflux or obstruction and thereby transpire more slowly. So if the form of the commodity encourages and relies on thinking quickly and empirically about things, um, you know, when there's like when, when things can slow down, you can actually in, have a form of thinking that, that, that like questions things or, you know, uh, act of a perceptual observation that prolongs the holdup, okay? And in the pause to which existing things and not useful ones belong, the temporality in which thinking about objects as objects of thought comes to the fore. And there's this unpublished fragment Benjamin published, uh, wrote in 1928 in which he refers to the way our, th our lives are dominated by propulsive thinking. Our thinking just glides from one object of thinking to another, but, but then he points to an alternative. And he says that everything is thought, but the task is to make a stopover at every, at, at, at every one of these many little thoughts, to spend the night uh, in a thought no direct flights to stop over, you know, like to sit for a second in the airport and think. Um, so clearly to spend the night in a thought or to have one of these layovers, a stopover, is to engage in an unaccelerated anti-capitalist form of thinking, okay? I guess what I would say is to occupy the time of thinking. And there's a name for Benjamin for this kind of thinking. Um, and the name for it is brooding, okay? the 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 notion of brooding, it comes up a handful of times in the book on the Trauerspiel in the morning plays, but it's, it's elaborated on in far more detail in the Arcades project. Um, brooding is the, the disposition wherein an image exists and asks to be thought. Okay? Um, and the result of this thinking, there are two important and insep um, inseparable features. The brooder, uh, how Benjamin de defines the brooder, is someone who meditates a thing, but then also meditates his meditation of the thing. So it is in the time that defines brooding that Benjamin begins to gesture toward the conditions of possibility for thinking differently about things. And 
key here is the recognition of error, right? The recognition of error and the construction of more authentic historical knowledge. Um, so the brooder does not just meditate a thing as an object of perception, although he does that. The brooder also begins to think again and anew about the way he previously thought about things. Um, so historical knowledge for Benjamin is bound up with an encounter with an object that illuminates the possible, but at the same time, the knowledge or recognition of a mistake. So I think from one standpoint, you can see brooding as bound up or as engaged in a form of authentic political learning. So rather than just accumulate knowledge and acquire skills to succeed within the extant economic order, the brooder is temporarily unmoored from that order and freed from the constraints on learning that it imposes. So the content or focus of brooding is not on the utility or exchange value of what they're learning, like I'm going to study this discipline because it's going to get me a good job. Um, but instead, um, what the brooder broods over is like the matter itself, but also past reflections on it. And Benjamin says that the, it's for this reason that brooding carries with it, it bears the imprint of memory. Okay. Now, readers new to Benjamin, maybe some of you might wonder, like, what's the proximity of the figure of the brooder and the existential de disposition of brooding uh, to Benjamin's near contemporary Martin Heidegger? And I think it's fair to note the affinity, but I also think it's probably accurate to say that Heidegger's post-war obfuscations about Nazism represent a belated confirmation of a sentiment that Benjamin expressed in a letter to Scholem. Uh, in January of 1930, Benjamin claimed, I'm working on a theory of historical knowledge, and he claimed that uh, about this project, quote, this is where I will find Heidegger, and I expect sparks will fly from the shock of the confrontation between our two very different ways of looking at history. And a few months later, he wrote to Sholem uh, that he and Brecht were organizing a reading group whose aim would be to annihilate Heidegger. <laughs> so I think the reasons for this is like, look, Benjamin, he is seeking to introduce into, I guess, what, what Heidegger would call the historical essence of the West. You know, it's, it's not just that being has been forgotten. That would be kind of the Heideggerian kind of point. But I think it would be like, no, the violence on which the capitalist social order is based on and which commodity production depends, that's something that has been you know, has been forgotten, okay? Um, in a long passage devoted to the figure of the brooder in the Arcades Project, Benjamin alleges that the brooder's memory ranges over an indiscriminate mass of dead lore, and like, almost like a rummager picks up particular pieces. And, you know, Benjamin was a huge fan of uh, jigsaw puzzles. He thought that, um, that there was something about the brooder and the construction of historical knowledge. Um, he claimed that, that like the era in which they were living was an era, uh, an epoch averse to brooding. I, I think we maybe still live in that area, that era. But, uh, but he thought that 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 the, the gesture of brooding, the outward, is is has been preserved somehow in people that like to put together jigsaw puzzles, because. Um, you like put these puzzles, you rummage around for particular pieces, and you're engaged in an act of construction. I think anybody that's tried to put a puzzle together can attest to that you can't just pick, put every piece together successively. Can you? No, I don't think you can. And so like there's a point, of course you consult the picture of the puzzle, but then isn't there a point in the construction of every puzzle where the picture is of no help? So you have to like, What's that shape? I'm looking for a piece this shape that will maybe fit in with this shape. And, and I think Benjamin's idea was that this, this gesture of putting together puzzles really is, has its analog in the how it is that we make political meaning out of objects. Like there's no natural fit between the sign and what it signifies. Um, the meaning of an object awaits the moment wherein it's invested with meaning, like this time of thinking. Um, and I think, I don't know, we were talking about this this morning, like how does one become a Marxist? Or uh, is it because someone told you Marxism is true? Uh, or or is, it, is it because you meet like the signifiers and the citations that constitute the discourse of Marx? And then you, you like pick up this or that piece from the indiscriminate mass of dead lore and like you test and construct for yourself and you, you make the meaning of Marxism for yourself not because someone told you it was true. 
Oh my God, okay, I'm almost done, just a second. Um, not really, but okay. Uh, so this, this Bruder's Memorial Cognition of Dead Lore and an epoch averse to brooding, construction of historical knowledge. Okay, these motifs get their sharpest expression in an essay I think some people in this class have read, which is on the concept of history, which is, I think represents the, the culmination of Benjamin's theorization of the potent temporality that belongs to the arrest of thinking. And I think it's, it's really remarkable that Benjamin, okay, in the spring of 1940, okay, is, is continuing to put at the center of politics an ontology of the object that commands our attention at the level of its image being and thereby halts our thinking. So it's not like you would think like what we need now is another manifesto or speech or editorial or programmatic party directive. But Benjamin's like, you've read this essay where he basically says you need to be like a, a, a Franciscan friar and go to a monastery and retreat from the world and its affairs, which is really kind of just, I don't know, an astonishing thing for someone like Benjamin to, to be calling for in the spring of 1940. Politics needs to turn away from the easily understood successive and transmissive speech acts that confine our thinking to empirical objects. So on the concept of history, it alludes to the barbarism of capitalist exploitation and waste. It invokes enslaved ancestors, the fight for crude and material things, the anonymous toil of those whose labor makes it possible for the creation of cultural treasures, and of course the famous pile of debris that the angel of history is looking at. But, but even these like material, uh, this material suffering uh, takes us takes a back seat to the time of thinking itself, um, and the clarification and creation of this time depends crucially on a moment of cognitive cessation. So, one of the best lines in, on the concept of history is Benjamin's claim that thinking involves not only the movement of thoughts but their arrest as well, and I think it's this arrest of thinking that has some profound implications for the ways we conceive of time itself. Okay. In the successive movement of thoughts, time is seized or occupied or filled up right? in such a way that one never conceptualizes or forms an idea of time. Okay. So like, capitalism depends on this human thinking that is like thoughtlessly, consumptively on the move. And when our thinking is only characterized by the movement of thoughts, we never get to that duration of brooding. And our thinking for that reason is shallow. And, and transient, you know. What Benjamin alleges is that inside of this ordinary, homogeneous, empty time is this, this other order of time entirely, which he calls messianic. You know, he refers to it as messianic and calls it now time. It's like this precious and tasteless seed that inheres in our ordinary time. Um, and this seed, I think, is the thing that conditions or has the chance to germinate in the object relation Benjamin puts at the heart of historical materialism. So in, on the concept of history, he sort of swaps out allegory and the allegorical object for the dialectical image or for this image from the past that, uh, that is an arrest of happening. Um, and it earns the adjective messianic because what happens in the stoppage of thought bears the signs of the divine. Like, we have a chance to name, name some things, like, you know, and, and know some things. Um, so what is clear in Messianic Now time is that, this is our good news for the day, uh, capitalism has not settled the meaning of objects once and for all, okay? Um, historical objects of perception can unexpectedly appear, and they're not immediately recognized as meaningful units of information or as part of successive thinking. Messianic now time, Benjamin says, is a present which is not a transition. It's a duration of time in which time takes a stand or comes to a standstill. And obviously the anxious question then is like, wait, what's gonna happen next, you know? Um, and I think Benjamin, uh, it is not clear that he has a definitive answer as to what comes next. So Benjamin's Messianism, he calls it a, a weak Messianism. And I'm here to say I think that the weak me weakness, when put before messianism, that's not like a that's not a that's not like a a, a, a defect of Benjamin's Marxism. Like weak messianism is its virtue, because the weakness lengthens the time for thinking, and the time of construction that follows cessation. Okay. I think weak messianism is Benjamin's bequest to Marxism. 
Weak messianism means we're not trapped or bound in time. Lord knows we're not out of time. No, no, we have the time to give new meanings to objects. Existentialism, you know, like, okay, so existentialism is a kind of thinking that then you make a choice and there's an action. So the existentialism kind of brings action into yeah. thought, you know. And so I was just wondering how would you characterize um, what then you mean? I mean, in a way, this is what your whole talk about, but I just yeah. wanted to hear you talk a little bit more about it. Like, how would you characterize what then you mean? is doing to Marx's ideas. Yeah. Like, does he just give up that idea of action? Um, I think this, how would you talk about that? I think this is one of the reasons why I've, I really struggle with like the, the idea that in the spring of 1940, somebody would basically advocate to turn away from the world and its affairs, when it seems to me that one of the most signal questions in the spring of 1940 is like, what is to be done? Which, would, which is a question about like, what am I supposed to do, you know? And the consequences of what was happening in the world led to Benjamin's you know, premature death. So like, wait, what is one supposed to do to fight against fascism, for example? You know, like, you would think that you would like do, you know, you would do something. And don't you think it's just weird that he basically claims, no, you need to retreat and start to think about the very conditions under which objects acquire meaning um, and I think I, I definitely think Benjamin so I think Benjamin is probably more in the he Benjamin has Hegel before Marx I think because the phenomenology is entirely about how it is one has a thought you know and it's not really about acting but I can see someone saying like wait a second like if we all now just don't do this, but like retired to like turned away from the world and its affairs, right? And spent some time lingering over the ways in which objects acquire political meaning. That wouldn't be a good thing, would it? So I don't know. Do you have to have, do two things at once? I mean, I think you know. I always think that you have to turn around. So it's true that thinking involves not just the movement of thoughts, but their arrest as well. But I think the other side of that is also true. Thinking doesn't just involve the arrest of thinking. It has to be, so, you, so I think you have this moment of cessation, but then you also have this moment of construction or, or, or action maybe. I don't know if that's kind of, if construction is the same as like intervening politically, like doing something. I do think that Benjamin is probably pretty close to, to the side of any political action you do has a kind of incalculable dimension to it. Like, there's no guarantee to it, you know? Like, what is to happen next? I don't think there's a script we don't exactly know, you know? I don't know if I answered your question yeah, or, or how, not. Yeah, or how, and how are you, I, I hear what you're saying, like, how are you loyal then to that succession of thinking? You know, rather than just, I mean, you experience it, but yeah. then, like, how would it affect you after? Yeah. You know? So in the Trauerspiel, he, he has this thing where he's trying to avoid a politics that becomes doctrinal. So he constantly advocates for this like starting and stopping. St or, no, I'd strike that from the record. It was stopping and starting, stopping and starting, stopping and starting. And he thinks that that's the way you avoid doctrinal, like automatic, this is what is to be done. 
here's this like political thing. It tells me in every single case what I should do, you know. And so there's, yeah. That's right. Um, and then also like the sensuousness being in the temporality. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, I think when you encounter an object and its image being, you're not really like, what does that mean? Or what is the larger narrative to which it belongs? Or how does this thing fit into what this larger whole? So when you're encountering that image being, it's been uncoupled from, cut from the larger narrative, whole, whatever that it was once a part of. So I think it's in the encounter with the object and its image being that you that this different order of temporality emerges because it's not propulsive or successive. It actually transpires more slowly. And so like, I don't know, maybe like in Arrival, there's these, there are like several images that keep recurring in the second part of the film. And you think they belong to the past, but then all of a sudden something radically unbelievable occurs. And all you can really do is note some of their visual properties. Like, oh, that, there's like a piece of clay in that image and the way it's like, so, so it's, the it's the object in its image being that is part of this different temporality in a way that like, when you're just reading like a, a novel, for example, you're just like successively, propulsively moving forward, you know? And I think he's interested in how do you call a halt to that? You know, how, what, by what means can artists, I think this is why he likes surrealists because he claimed like sur, a, a surrealist work of art, he, it doesn't have a little chink, a slot, like he called it the penny slot of meaning. You can't just like, no, it doesn't have that, you know? Um, I was gonna say something else, but I just forgot it. Anyone? So maybe he makes the point that you kind of need to like remove yourself from the world to be able to kind of have those movements. And I was curious how you would make that like applicable to like the masses. Because I don't know, in my head, I feel like yes, it's beneficial to like the individual. But then how does it make real movement in the world and how do you get to then move along and go with that? That's a great question. I mean, I guess my question for you would be, do you think the masses, that one feature of political movements could be this, what I'm calling this time for thinking? You know what I mean? Like thinking about the, the causes and objects that are at the center of a political movement and thinking about how they acquired the meaning that they acquired. Now, how, in fact, that would be done, I don't know. I mean, there are meetings of political movements, the actors that are involved. And I mean, some of this, I think, is can transpire in a, in a class that you're taking where you're not just becoming a disciple of the professor. You're actually trying to think the meaning of objects for yourself. And I mean, it would be, it's difficult. I have no doubt that it's, you know, no doubt that it's difficult. I don't think, um, I don't know if Benjamin, I don't know if he thinks that some revolutionary activity is, has not been sufficiently theorized, you know, hasn't been sufficiently made the subject of some thinking beforehand. And like there's this famous line of Benjamin's where people think that the way to bring about revolution is to hasten, like accelerate capitalists so it'll collapse, you know. Um, and I think he has this opposite idea, like it's not making the locomotive travel faster, it's pulling the brake on the locomotive, calling it to a halt. And then we all have this chance, like this interregnum, this like momentary suspension where the meaning of things are all up for grabs, you know? 
and they become the subject of dialogue and their own, like maybe a different investiture of, of meaning, you know. Yeah, I'm thinking about that, um, any of these, the metaphor of like reflux that you brought up. Yeah. And to me, it seems like we're like, considering the problem of linear thinking and contrary to any of these like messianic time, and yeah. messianic thinking time. Yeah. And it, within that dialectic, I'm, I'm like curious about like where, I don't know if this is an important question to ask, but where like a principal agency lies, because it almost seems like rather than within the subject coming to a contradiction or a point of rupture, it's almost that rupture already exists inherently in the world. And the reflux is that the world itself at the outside is rejecting linearity. Hmm. And I think that creates a space almost where the subject itself is ruptured in relation to the world. Yeah, I think I like this idea like that is reflux something that's brought about by human activity, or is it already a part of the structure itself, necessarily so? And I think that's, so it's, it's a question, like now time, now time is happening right now. It's, it's inherent in every single second, you know? So it's not like it's an invention. I think it belongs to the very ontological constitution of a social order and I mean, I thought that that idea of reflux is just such an interesting one because Marx is describing, like he's a political economist who's trying to describe like the vicissitudes of capital. So he, but he comes really close to like, and he doesn't really ruminate over like, wait, what is money when it forms into a hoard? Like, it's just like, I don't know. Could you like use money as your wallpaper? Like, yeah, you could find a different use for it, you know? And like, what is labor power when it's idle? I mean, there are a lot of things people can do when they're not working, you know? And then an unsaleable stock of commodities, like, aren't there a bunch of other uses that could be made of those things? So, uh, yeah, I think I like this idea that, that the, the condition of reflux is not something that is necessarily brought about by human activity, it's part of the capitalist system itself. It's a contradiction within capitalism itself. And I don't think capitalism can ever, isn't this true? It can never realize its impossible fantasy of operating as quickly as the time of thinking itself. That's just not possible. But it's trying in certain ways. You know, there is this book that was published maybe 10 or 12 years ago called the, is it called The End of Sleep? I think, 20, I think it's called 24-7, The End of Sleep, yeah where like there are, there are attempts to try to reduce our need for sleep so that you can be more productive. And like that's just way, like sleep is like a great, the author of this book I think alleges that sleep's a great affront to capital. Because it's just like, what are you doing sleeping, man? Like you need to be like on Amazon buying shit, you know, or, or like you need to be productive. And like there are attempts to try to create like, to end nighttime in certain parts of the world like by artificial or technological means so that, that because if there's sufficient light then we can like mine the ore out of the, the material minerals out of the ground 24 hours a day seven days a week you know and i think if you think of like automated labor you know like the machine doesn't need a break machine's not asking for overtime pay it doesn't need to eat and like get a half an hour break by law you know so i think there are all these mechanisms that are I think he's right about like this attempt to continue to continue to accelerate and accelerate, but eventually there is kind of a limit there, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how would you go about? Because um, I think you're doing a really good job, like using Benjamin to identify all of these things in, in like the, the pragmatic world. Um, but how would you go about um, applying him or thinking about him in terms of like individual action to affect change uh, in the political world, given like how you said, like his maxim for individuals, you know, retreat from society and politics was kind of proven not the best idea in 
1940? Yeah. Well, I would say one thing about the last comment, which is I think the retreat is really just a preparation for some reemergence. So I don't think the hibernation or the return from the world is not is a is a turn a retreat from politics. Maybe it's just a necessary phase before one reengages. But what to do individually? I don't know. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I mean, one kind of a few basic takeaways I have would be to really stop and think about the degree to which we consume, you know, like, and our thinking is kept propulsively on the move, you know, like scroll, 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 it's just in a never ending. So would there be things that, could you live without buying as many things as you buy, you know? And can you live, can you find moments where this different kind of temporality is there to, for the taking? Like, can you give yourself some time to think? Because I think so much of our life is really about like, what's the utility? What am I going to get out of this? So the logic of exchange value means I do X for Y. But can you ever do X for X? I didn't mention this, you know, the, the, the I didn't mention this film in another part of this thing. That, there was this movie that came out in 2013. I think it's called All is Lost. It stars Robert Redford. And it's a movie without dialogue, basically. He's uh, out in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Has anyone ever seen this movie? And he's like, he's trying to get as far away from civilization, I believe, as possible. But I think it does test the thesis that there is a spot on the world that is immune to capitalist modernity. Because he's on this ship, and all of a sudden, a shipping container that has fallen off of a one of those big giant things that brings all the crap that we buy, you know, all the stuff that we buy, and it falls off and it gashes his boat, you know. And then you, you get this great image. I think it's one of the best images of capitalism. It's just like dozens of pairs of brand new sneakers are just like bobbing on the Indian Ocean. Like if you want an image of capitalism, that like when I said before, like capitalism performs the extraction for us, it's like dozens of brand new shoes are just bobbing in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, you know, and it's like, Wait, where, why are those shoes coming in the way they are coming, you know? So, I don't know, do you think that like changing your consumption patterns has a, has a is like an individual action that you could per undertake to try to like subtract yourself from the world of capitalism? And do you think like rejecting the new and, the, and that which is fashionable on the theory that like, I gotta get it, I, that's the newest thing. Like, do you think you can kind of like disconnect from that, you know, unplug from that? Yeah, do you think that has any efficacy as a political gesture? Uh, well, yes, for me personally, certainly. Um, I just worry that, like, I can do that because I'm lucky enough to have the time to go to talks about Walter Benjamin. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> I would just not just not invalidate it at all. I just, I just worry, like, you know, people who have to work, like, three jobs a day, like, like what can we do to even give them the chance to reflect like that? I agree. I agree. Before I ask a question, I'm going to ask one. Um, just one thing about what Shane said. There's a there's this group called Underground Theory, and they're for like earbuds for people working at Amazon, and so they're like specifically theorizing for people that are working three jobs a day. Um, but my question is a it's a Hegel question. So uh, you said that, that in a way Ben Bean is like uh, putting Hegel before Marx, right? But I, th I think there are two things where I was just like, it made me think, like, is that true? And the first one is this thing about the retreat from the world and the, 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 using the monk as the, like, there, there is no figure that Hegel hated more than monks. And the monk, Like, yeah. he thought, he, he even says, like, the monkish retreat from the world. And that's like, for him, there's no worse thing you can say about someone. And then the other thing is the whole. Like, for Hegel, if thought isn't thinking the whole, it's not thinking. And so, is, is, and I, I'm not saying even Hegel's right about this, but I'm just, yeah. I'm just kind of questioning that, like, he, that Benny means on the side of Hegel against yeah. Marx. Like, I, I just, I wonder how, I mean, maybe you can reconcile those things. I guess, I, I mean, two, two ideas. One is um, um, maybe the thing to emphasize in the invocation of monks is really their discipline. And maybe I could like so watch me do this like little backflip here. Like, okay, it doesn't have to be the monkish retreat, but there's a discipline to that kind of thinking, like a rigor to that kind of thinking, that I think maybe is 
puts Benjamin on the side of Hegel to some degree. So it's not the retreat from the world, it's the discipline of the monk that you think he's drawn. I think the line is something like monastic discipline, but yeah. Okay, maybe not. Um, I mean, on the question of the whole, I guess it's just the, the it's the, like, like uh, 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 even in on, on the concept of history, thinking itself becomes the object of thinking. Like, because he says, like, the, 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 when you blast that image out of the continuum, it's, he claims it has a monadic, it's, it becomes like a monad. The question would be, like, is that monad already a whole? But then he does say, like, that then it's not just the monad is, it's thinking the monad becomes the monad. And then, I don't know, that's why I kind of think like, isn't Hegel's whole thing really about what are the conditions under which thought, tran thought of an object transpires, you know? Okay. Yeah, that's convincing. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Yeah. Um, I just have a question because there are several questions that um, talk about sort of this binary between thinking and acting. And I am, I mean, also interested because I kind of these days identify myself as a secular monk. <laughs> a secular monk. And I always like this idea of brooding because I spent maybe nine years in my PhD program just brooding <laughs> over these things. So I can't really uh, speak from my experience, but I, I don't think we have to necessarily think that thinking and acting are two different things. And this type of arrest of time, almost which I identify with this affect, you know, this time um, charged with affect. And this can happen in the most sort of hyper moment of activism. For instance, like revolutionaries, after revolution um, took place, and then they have to draft a new constitution. But at that moment, their hands are paralyzed with anxiety, with excitement. This is, I think, what Benjamin uh, means by arrest of time. Yeah. In the sense that, like, it's it's the time that is charged with this libidinal sort of excitement and anxiety. This also can happen to, like, Freud reports, for instance, in one of his um, working class patients, very rare, housemaid, and she fell in love with the the master. And suddenly, all her daily chores and activities, right, that her hands were like, just there to wash dishes and so on, suddenly paralysis. Because now it's uh, charged with erotic affect. Hmm. And this makes people think, this moment of affectively charged um, experience. Hmm. And it can happen to revolutionaries, it can happen to working class uh, workers. So we, we, we should not necessarily think that this is only something uh, reserved for elites. I mean, right. of course, we, we do it as a job. Right. And I think the role of arts and humanities today are creating this role. Because right. even when I was in, in graduate program, there's a lot of students, I mean, all of us are under pressure to publish, pressure to be productive, right. you know, um, and so on and so forth. But really, we need this time, and, and everybody can experience this. Uh, and I think that's why for me, the unconscious or the drive is more related, not so much to act, but actually this moment of paralysis, like contemplation or meditation. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that the, this now time is not the exclusive property of some and doesn't belong to others. It's available to all. And I think I, 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 I mean, if I'm hearing you correctly, basically this now time, this messianic moment of cessation, which is paralyzing, but it's a productive kind of paralysis yeah. because, why? Because what I decide to do next will be something that I contemplated, I considered. I didn't just act automatically. Whereas I think so much of, aren't we all the time being conditioned, like, like our sentences, we're typing them on Google, on Gmail, and it already like puts the next three words in front of us, like it, before we even, and like I'm talking in my house about something and the next thing when I'm online, I see an ad for that very thing. Like it's, they're already out ahead of us. And they're trying to make things more automatic. But I think you're saying, wait a second, in that moment that comes to a halt, you might not be doing anything, 
but you actually are kind of doing something because you're thinking. Yeah, that's what the unconscious is, and I think it's interaction. You know, the, how the unconscious has more to do with this, I think, reflexivity of thought than, um, you know, some reservoir of this uh, animalistic instinct to repress yeah, things true. coming back from the past. And I think that today the problem uh, is, is not so much the inertia of, of the act. I mean, there is political indifference and inertia, but at the same time, there are so many false hyperactivities in political arenas, that people are zealous, but they don't know what they're zealous about and what those, you know, problems, we don't know what the problems are, really. Like, we need to redefine what the problems are, and that's why I think we, we need the thinking, and thinking can be an act itself. I mean, I think Benjamin was really critical of, I can only imagine that it would be even intensified today, like the way in which media and the so-called information, like the degree to which we're just so enmeshed in the call and response of media information that there is no, we don't even know what to, I mean, we think we do, like we're responding to the latest thing and we like, we want to make our voices known, but we don't even really know what it is that we are, are and should be organized against. Jeff has a final question. <laughs> um, I was thinking about how this like reflux is already in capitalism, and it seems like one of the big areas of tension that we've all been talking about is like how this cessation turns into some kind of like political action. And that was kind of like what I was thinking about was whether the cessation is there to be able to transition to the political action, or whether the cessation is itself like the new revolutionary like act. So instead of like in capitalism where you have a cessation and it's there just so you can get back to production, it seems like what Benjamin's trying to do is invert that mm -hmm. to say, I'm in production, but I can't wait to get back to this cessation. Yeah. So the whole point is to like invert things. Yeah. I mean, I do wonder if cessa we do have to eventually get back to being productive, right? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, I don't think Benjamin is on the side of like permanent cessation, you know. I was just thinking about like where the real like accent of like revolutionary yeah. change Yeah. I definitely think the real, the, the moment for a revolution, the most authentic form of revolutionary thinking is one that includes this stopping and starting, stopping and starting. It has, these, has a moment of cessation that allows for us to think the very conditions of what counts as revolutionary. And I think, yeah, I would go back to that weak messianism idea because I think the real, the, the opposite of weak messianism is strong messianism and we don't want that. Like, they know exactly what the goal is, you know. And so I think it's a cautionary tale about political ideals that are locked in and certain as they're kind of imaginary in that way. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Yeah.